What a night in Eugene. The Oregon Ducks pulled off one of the greatest regular season victories in program history, defeating Ohio State in a matchup of top five teams. I am Aaron Fentress of the Oregonian and Oregon Live, filling in once again for Joey Harrington, who is still being held captive because Joey Harrington's ransom check bounced. So what? I'm just gonna say right now, Joey, we need cash to get Jordan back on here so you guys can remove me as a host. Until then, I'm taking over this show as usual. But anyway. Hold hey, on, hold on, hold is, on. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Who said go we ahead. want you to leave? Who said, like, because you hosted last week and we won. Maybe we don't want Jordan back. <laughs> Maybe we've found the winning formula going forward. I'll... You know? Maybe that's why your check bounced. Okay. I'm okay. not saying. I, I'm, I, I I'm just that. saying. Anyway, you know? I'm joined by Joey Harrington and Anthony Newman, and we will examine this game frontwards and backwards. We'll talk about how big of a win it was for the program and for Coach Lanning and also the play of Dylan Gabriel. But first, oh, and also later we'll be joined by George Reiser, who I know is going to come in and give me major grief the entire time, but that's okay. I signed up for that. But first, let's talk about the sheer event itself, the atmosphere the, the fans, the crowd, you two both were there. You've played many games at Austin State. You've, you've attended many games, but by all accounts, that place was a madhouse. Ohio State fans were leaving going, oh my God, that said this place was crazy. It was even more crazier than they said it was going to be. And they left with a lot of respect for the atmosphere, the environment, the fan base. What did you guys experience during this very magical moment there at Austin Stadium? Anthony, you go first. Well, age before, age before you know, beauty. Being a Duck alum, it was a blast. It really was. Uh, there was a lot of red in, in that stadium. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, we got a lot of red going on here. Uh, but uh, that was the greatest game. It was one of, you know, one of the best games uh, in a long time. It, re it really was. You got two football teams going at it, going at it uh, played great football, not sloppy football. Uh, and just, uh, you know, as the Duck alum again, I'm, I'm happy with the outcome. Hey, Oregon, you know, pulled it off. Uh, they're going to see each other again. It's coming. We, I, I think we all know that. Uh, but at least Oregon now understands that they can play with anybody in the country. Joey? So we had Verone on last week, right? And asked him that question of what is the NFL, what are the – what do players in NFL locker rooms think about Oregon? And his response was quick. It was, well, they can get close, but they can't win the big one. Now, I'm not saying this was a national championship. No, I'm saying, like, but this was the entire country watching. Like, there was nobody else. It, unless you were a fan of... God, I don't even know who else was playing at that time during the day. Like, they, nobody else was watching any other game in the entire country that day once Red River was over. And so what Oregon did in that moment was, was show up, right? Not only did, and we'll get to the football team stuff, but the Oregon crowd showed up. I mean, the... the the urban legends of Autzen Stadium. Nobody, you know, oh, how can this tiny little stadium be so loud? They showed up. The fans, not just in terms of like being loud and being, you know, Autzen crazy, but I'll tell you how many, Anthony, you're right. Just walking through, through campus, there was a lot of red. I was nervous. <laughs> respect to they the fans. Well. They Res travel well. Respect to, to the Oregon fans. I had more interactions with Ohio State, you know, fans. Hey, how you doing, man? Welcome to Eugene. I hope you have a terrible time between 4:30 and 7:30. But other than that, enjoy your trip, right? And that seemed to be the the overwhelming feeling from most Oregon fans. So, congrats on that. The Duck with the greatest entrance in Duck in Duckdom in in Oregon mascot history. Like pulling Hugh Jack, like literally all the pieces that could come together came together. It was, it was the most exciting football game at Autzen Stadium that I have been to as a fan. Now I know there were plenty of games that I played, you know, that came down to the end, and you know we were, we had a knack for you know not winning, not not taking care of business early in their games. Um, but as a fan, that, that, was, that was it. Like, I haven't felt like that at Autzen Stadium in, in two decades. I mean, I'll be honest. Like, that was, that was um, 
I was standing on the sideline before the game, and they still play, they're playing the, the national anthem and looking up where my grandpa and the rest of the family used to sit in section 17. And to look at where this program has come from then in 97, 98, 99, Anthony for you in like, you know, 67, 68, 69. <laughs> Wait, what? Damn. Wait, to look what? at from where the program has come from then until now. And we're on the national stage and we showed up. Now, this is that moment, and I know I'm going long, I don't care. This is don't the moment that we segment. get to. Hold on, sh <laughs> shut up, I'm not done. Um, we get to enjoy it. And we get to enjoy it until segment two. Because from that moment forward, if you don't start thinking about Purdue, they're going to do what Vandy did to Alabama. <laughs> we got right. this much more time. Okay, so, so real quick though, 32-31 thriller. Uh, give me a key moment. For me, Dylan Gabriel's touchdown run on think, 32 when he kept it and then just scooted and juked a couple guys, made it 29-28. And then, of course, the offensive pass interference there late, which Ohio State fans were freaking out about. To me, former receiver, you, you, you extend like that and shove a guy. That, that helps your specific route, by the way. Like it's that. offensive PI. I'm curious, what Anthony, what you think just about that as a DB, and then what's your biggest moment from the game? Well, the pass interference, guys, the pass interference calls, it goes both ways. And in, in today's game, the offense is going to get the call most of the time. They will get the call. And I think offensive personnel, the players, the coaches, they know that the, the, the officials will choose the offense all the time. And when they don't, people go crazy. That's what happens. Uh, you know, I think the moment of the game for me was – when Will Howard slid on the on on the on the ground on the turf, uh, and the clock showed zero, <laughs> that, that that was that was the moment because this game came it down to over, what right. six seconds. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, and they're in field goal range. Come on. So how did no, you they know? Were. What's they that? Were. That's why they ran a play. They weren't quite in field goal range. That's why they ran the play. Now he slid into field goal range. That's what I'm saying. Yes, he slid into field goal range. So that was the key moment when I'm looking at the clock and it's showing zero. The game's over. No field goal. No field goal. Guys, you know can, can, can we please, and I don't know that we'll ever get a straight answer out of this, and we may be going down the conspiracy theory path here, but we, we can talk about the, the onside kick. You know, was that planned? Were you trying to kick it into him? Was he trying to just, you know, if it doesn't hit him, then it just, you know, you hit a deep squib. Um, what, what an incredible momentum change. Um, but if Dan Lanning and Tosh Lapoy intentionally got a 12-man on the field <laughs> penalty, which some people are saying they called timeout and then decided I'm going to sacrifice five yards for five seconds or four seconds. If that's actually what happened, holy hell, guys. I know. Could there be a more brilliant, like absolutely incredible game-changing decision? Like it, it was mind-blown. Okay, like how – Okay. Oh, I, but I'm it not didn't really matter because he I, threw the out right away and there was no extra coverage over there. They just didn't complete the, the play. Um, but no, but it is no, no, no. It is they clouded the coverage to him because he came running onto their sideline, and then you watch the DB. The corner comes up in cloud coverage, so it started to look like an open uh, square out. Then turned into throwing an out route against a cloud cloud DB. I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's cheating, though. All right, <laughs> <laughs> let's wrap up there for now. Uh, we'll go to break and come back and talk about the play of Dylan Gabriel. This was a signature performance for him, no doubt. And we're also later going to get into what this win meant for Lanning, which, you know, the legacy conversation just out of whack sometimes. But this was a huge win for him. We'll talk about all that and more coming up next on Talking Ducks. Wait, no, 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 Fentress. Hold on one more second before we get to go to, go to break because we have to enjoy it for one more minute. Woo! Now we can go to break. <laughs> Dylan, you have as much experience as anyone. How much did that help you in a game where you just have to keep answering drive after drive? I think naturally you're, you're put in situations um, never the same, but pretty similar. 
um, and you just use your your knowledge from past experiences to to your advantage. And um, you know, I, I think I've been in many games where it came down to a drive or two, and in times you need points in the red area, and you know things don't change in that end. It just magnifies in big games of you know third down, fourth down, uh, red area touchdowns. Um, you know, continue to be really good on first and second, so you're in manageables. But um, you know, I just think in all we up front as a unit we came together and, and found a way and um you know i tried to use my my knowledge you know as best as i can with this team and our guys um but we all help e each other because they played a bunch of balls well welcome back to talking ducks that was oregon quarterback dylan gabriel talking about his day at austin stadium and what a day it was he passed for 340 and two touchdowns had some beautiful deep ball dimes and also a killer Yard, our 29, was a 29 yard touchdown run? I can't remember to give them the lead in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, there's been, there's been some heat on Dylan a little bit after those red zone picks. Some fans were, were worried a little bit, but man, he showed up. Joey, how do you think he performed on that big stage? He was, he, he was everything that we needed him to be, right? And, and I don't think it's wrong to say that you could make an argument. Well, somebody said to me that I was watching the game and, and thought that Ohio State looked like the better team. I was like, well, what I will say is they just, Ohio State looked incredibly steady. Just bam, ba, bam, ba, bam, ba, bam, ba, bam. Offense, defense had it all. The difference, and we talked about it last week, is there were, what? The deep ball, the, the, the throw to Tez for the touchdown, the deep ball up the Oregon sideline. Dylan running for the touchdown in the fourth quarter. There are three plays where he put them on his back. Three explosive plays. And that was, that was the difference in the ball game is Oregon made those explosive plays via Dylan Gabriel. Like that was it. Like it, it, was, it was everything you could want from a quarterback. He facilitated when he needed to facilitate. He... Um, he managed what he needed to manage, and then he exploded when the opportunity came. It was, it was, it was perfect. That performance for me, I'll go to you in a second, Anthony, is why I always push back against the idea that, oh, they just have to get the ball to the playmakers. No, your quarterback nope. needs to make some plays. Yep. And those deep passes were money. It's one thing for guys to get open deep. You got to hit it, and you got to hit it in the pocket. You got to hit it when dudes are coming. And he just dropped dime after dime after dime. I can't – I mean, he wasn't perfect, but I can't remember – a big play that he missed. Like if a dude was open over the middle on a dig or a post, he was hitting it and they were moving and, and they were trying to get to him. One of, the, one of the best throws was when James picked up a blitz, but James got pushed back right into Gabriel's lap and he stood there in the pocket and threw, I think it was a, a deep out or maybe a deep kind of comeback, 12 yards or whatever. And it was a dime and there was a DB there. He's off a little bit. That could be picked six the other way and he just dropped it right in there. I thought he was fantastic. Anthony, what'd you think? Well, I, you know, I said this prior to the game, uh, Dylan has to play better than Will Howard. Uh, Will Howard is a good quarterback. As a matter of fact, I'm really impressed in how he played. Tough kid. Uh, but Dylan was throwing the ball, like you said, Aaron, all over the place. And a lot of times as DBs, we talk about the long foul ball. You know, when there's a receiver that gets past you and he, he's beating you, and all of a sudden, the quarterback overthrows him. Oh, long foul ball. Doesn't count. There were no long foul balls. <laughs> I mean, he was connecting to the receivers uh, as they went ran right past the Ohio State defensive backs. And that's what – that right there, it, it tells me what type of receivers we have. Guys who can run. Tez Johnson, Evan Stewart. They can run because they ran right past those defensive backs – uh, and then, and then Dylan Gabriel took advantage of it, you know, and so you have to connect with that when that happens, you know, it can't be an overthrown ball. Uh, so that was nice. And then Dylan Gabriel with his legs. And I said this also, when you have a quarterback that can run a little bit, he can run more than a little bit. And he ran for that touchdown. I think it was about a 32 yarder. That was a killer for Ohio state. And, and Will Howard could run also, but he was trying to run and escape to throw the football. Dylan was like, Hey, I'll take it to the house. Hey guys, we we talked hey, we've talked to all all season so far about just dink and dunk, dink and dunk, dink and dunk. Four four plays, you know. We talked about them already. The 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 deep ball up the sideline. Anthony, you said wide receiver beats him, drops him in the bucket. I've overthrown that plenty of times. You just get excited and you and you put too much on it. 
The one that, uh, and then the, the touchdown to Tez. I mean, you would talk about putting it in the perfect spot for where only his wide receiver could get it. Like yep. that catch in the end zone, like he couldn't have put it anywhere else. The one that, the other one that, that stands out to me, and when you said Evan Stewart, he threw a, uh, it was, we won't, we won't call it a basic, but we'll call it like a, like a read route over the middle. And he put it right in his basket, and Evan Stewart took a shot from that safety oh, and yeah. held on. So what did he do? He he made the exciting open throw that everybody over you know overthrows. He put it absolute dime for a touchdown. He was throwing, he was threading it in there for his wide receivers to make tough catches. Those are the balls that we talked about over the middle of the field that are going to be the difference for this season. That's exactly what he did. And then you know just hop on my back. I'm gonna do it with my legs. He was spec. Spectacular. Mm -hmm. Evan Evan had uh, 149 yards and a touchdown. His big play, 69 yards. He dragged the DB another 15 yards. Okay, things are getting, things are being it's just too light and happy around here. Rainbows and sunshine. I got to bring things down a little bit. So <laughs> let's talk about the defense. No Jordan Birch. Uh, you know they they did enough to win the game, but you know they gave up 467 yards, 6.9 yards per play. And Ohio State had they not run at a time, they were definitely going to at least get a good field goal shot there at the end. So. Do we walk away from this wondering about the defense at all as we move forward and wondering if they can, you know, help this victory hold up later on down the road when you play better offenses or offenses as good as Ohio State? Well, I'll make this Newman. quick. I know we don't have a lot of time. You're playing against one of the top teams in the country, Aaron. Are you kidding me? That's my point. I mean, That's my point. They're going to play again. When you get into the conference championship, when yes. you get into the playoffs, you're going to play against those top teams. And you know the, the defense looked vulnerable. No, no, they didn't. Because okay. you did enough. You did enough to win the football game. You made enough stops. You know, uh, Ohio State was four eleven on third down or four twelve on third down. You did a great job on third down. Ohio State usually runs the football all over the place. And now with Chip Kelly, they want to run the football. And you can't stop great running backs. You can't stop a great system. But you can contain them. And Oregon did that with their with without Jordan Birch. They did it with all their defensive linemen, with their linebackers. They did it as a team. That was a great team effort uh, by Oregon to going against a very good offense with the quarterback that really impressed me. And, and Joe, I think he did as you as well, because the kid was a baller. I mean, he was sitting back in their pocket. Offensive lineman was beat up. They had guys getting hurt, falling, falling out left and right. But still, Oregon played for four quarters against a very good football team that was explosive, held the running back to only one explosive run. That was, that was, that was on point. We have to point out Derek Harmon's strip, which was a huge oh, moment yeah. in the game, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Joey, what were your impressions of Oregon's defense? And just by the way, just so everyone knows, I lay awake at night trying to think of ways to push Newman's button. I knew that was money. <laughs> After the game, I was like, oh, I'm going to get Newman with this one. Anyway, go ahead. So what I was going to say before you set that up was like, okay, great. I'll come in the mid, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of split the difference between the antagonist over here with Fentress and Newman, who's the ultimate homer. Gone are the days of 10 to 7 national championship games, type games, right? That, that, that's not college football anymore. You know, we're seeing... When top five teams play, no matter how good their defenses are, you're going to see 27-24. You're going to see 32-31. That is how college football has evolved. I mean, you saw it with, with Alabama. They, you know, the, the Nick Saban, you know, incredible defenses were still giving up points in those national championship runs. So I'm not at all concerned about this defense. The key for these defenses is to shut down the lesser teams, right? Which they did last week against Michigan State. What I am a little bit concerned about is the extent to which Jordan Birch is hurt. Um, yeah. He was coming, he was showing up two weeks ago um, and... And I'm happy to see Oregon win without him. However, um, he'd sure be nice to have as the season goes along. All right, we have to go to break. We're going to come back and overanalyze what this win meant for Dan Lanning and the program. You know, what's so hard about football um, is this game is such an emotional game. It's such an impactful game. And in moments like this where you, you want to be filled with complete joy, the relief is, is one of the biggest feelings you feel, right? Because of how hard your guys worked, how bad you know they wanted it. But it's never about the team that wants it the most. It's never about the team that just has great emotion. It's about the team that executes. So, uh, you know, I'm, I am. I'm filled with uh, great excitement. I'm really proud of our guys. But I'm also really excited to, 
you know, figure out what we can go attack and improve because the team we are today, October 12th, is not going to be the same team we are in December. Many people have harped on the career of Dan Lanning only in terms of the fact of him not winning the big one, whatever that really means. But this time, he definitely won a huge game, as we said at the top of the show, arguably the greatest regular season victory of all time in top four or five, of course. So let's get into this, guys. And, and, and I feel it just has, you know, just this overkill uh, feel to it. But how big of a win was this for Dan Lanning? And was it program altering? Who are you going to first on this one? Joey. Ah, I was just throw it up there for one of y'all. Joey, take it. Let's go you, Joey. Joey, take it. Joey, take it. <laughs> okay. Um, how big of a win was this at Autzen? So there's, there's three things. How big of a, was a, a win at Autzen? Um, it was, we've, we've discussed this. This was absolutely electric. It was the only, the first, only time that two top five, let alone top three teams have played each other at Autzen. And, and, and that, that place lived up to what it was billed to be. How big was it for Lanning? Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a TBD. Um, you know, there have been, I don't want to say conversations, but people, yeah, stupid people like Fentress, you know, keep mentioning, oh, you lose twice to Washington. Um, you know, that's a stain on your resume. Um, ah, I never said stain. I know, I know. I'm putting words in your mouth. Um, but it is nice, right? Let's, let's, let's turn the page on that, right? Phenomenal win. Some great coaching decisions. Um, and, and frankly, they overcame some, some mistakes that the guys, that the guys made on the field, uh, I think because of some of those, those coaching decisions. So I, I think in terms of the narrative around him as a coach and, a, you know, uh, we can, we can turn that page. Um, that being said, it doesn't, you know, you still have to go win a national championship like that. That's still the ultimate goal. Is it program altering? Hell no, no, it's not. It's not. It was the biggest win. You know, you, you, could, you could have the conversation about whether it was the biggest win at Autzen. You could have the conversation about was it the most electric? Will it be a springboard? But no, it's not program altering. The only thing that can alter this program is winning a, winning a national championship. Thank you. But that's literally it. We, we, we have done everything else. We've won conference championships. We've won back-to-back -back conference championships. We've won Rose Bowls and Fiesta Bowls and, and BCS and college football playoff. Literally, the only thing left we have to do is, is, is win a national championship. And we haven't been able to do that. And so oftentimes, those big wins during the season, like at Ohio State a couple years ago, then become an afterthought. And so if we don't do the rest of the things down the road, then this game becomes an afterthought. So, no, it's not program altering, uh, but it sure was a hell of a lot of fun. That, that's for sure. We're going to talk a lot about that more with George. I want to get George's opinion on that. And I have a list of big wins that didn't lead to much in the future. But, Newman, first, your take. You seem to agree with Joey. Yeah, I do. Uh, and I said that uh, prior to the game also. You know, it's, it's early in the season. There's a lot of football left. Yes, this was a great win. Okay, you, you, you know, a good football team came to Austin Stadium and you took care of business and you beat them and you played four quarters of football. Now, okay, you celebrate and then you move on. And, and, and the biggest win that Dan Lanning can get is the national championship game. So <laughs> right now, it's a great win. Okay, everybody, had, hey, they played well. Coaches did a good job. Now let's move forward. Don't be Alabama. You beat Georgia, and you come back, and you lose to Vanderbilt. Come on. They lost to Vandy. Have you heard the rant on, <laughs> on Feinbaum's show? Anyway. <laughs> How do you lose to Vandy? Anyway, so I agree 100%. So it's easy, and it's kind of for entertainment purposes, purposes to say, oh, he needs this win. He needs the signature, blah, blah, blah. To me, they just need to play really well. And that game could have gone either way, right? So had they lost that game, had there not been a PI call, Ohio State kicks a field goal and a win, I don't walk away from that feeling less about Dan Lanning or less about the program. Sometimes you win some close games, sometimes you lose some. It's a lot like last year when they went to Washington and lost a game that could have gone either way. And some people blew it out of proportion. But the bottom line is Dan Lanning's winning. Dan Lanning's recruiting. Dan Lanning's doing the things he needs, he needs to do to be successful. And the bigger victories are going to come as long as you stay on that path. He's in the middle of his third year as a head coach. So for anyone to say he had to have this or had to have that, nope. 
But that said, it was still huge, right? Because yeah. now they're six and zero. Now you control your destiny completely. Even if you lose one game, you're probably still going to be in the conference championship game, and it helps for seeding if we, if you get into the playoffs. So it's huge, but it wasn't the end all to be all that some people have made it out to be. All right, we have to go to break because we've gone long on some of these. Uh, Topics, but next up, George Reister, who just called me. I think he's getting impatient. He wants to get in here and take me to task because I picked Ohio State, and that's fine. But that will be next here on Talking Ducks. We are joined for the second week in a row by former Oregon tight end George Reister, host of the Unafraid Show on YouTube, and also host of Nightcap on Mad Dog Radio on Sirius XM. George, welcome to the show. Are you still on Clyde Nine or what? I mean, have you come down yet from hey, man, that, big, that victory? Yeah, we enjoy the win for one day. It is back to work. Got a game on Friday. Like Kobe Bryant says, job's not finished. Job's not finished. We enjoy the win, and it was a huge moment. You, you understand it. You called it a statement win. You were like, oh, this has to be one of those program wins. And I know that on this show, you're going to try to minimize it and its importance and everything else after you tried to magnify it because you thought the Ducks were going to lose. Okay. All, <laughs> some of the facts you said are correct. How you mix it together is nonsense. But we'll get to that later. Are we let's really going to that? Am I telling the truth? We'll, we'll, we'll Anthony, Anthony we'll Joey, that. am I telling the truth? Let's get to it now. I didn't minimize it at all. I said it was a huge win. I let's talk about it see, now. Y'all be just lying about Man, me. That's, that's, I'm, that's, that's, I'm, 90% of the crap I deal with is just I'm checking out. I'm lying. Am I checking out done? Like, Do we even talk for a minute? No, no. Here, let me get to the top. I'm going to get to the top. You don't have to play chess this week. Okay. So, I saved my game from last week. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so, George, before, before we get into that stuff, you were there. I talked to the other guys earlier about how m- amazing the atmosphere was. One of the things I found cool, and I didn't go to the game, but just seen on TV and videos, seeing a lot of the former Ducks. I saw Kenyon, St- Jonathan Stewart, there, just many, Ty- Tyrell Crosby, oh et cetera, God. et cetera. What was the experience like for you? Not just everything from the atmosphere, the, the fans, seeing the former Ducks and the camaraderie you guys uh, clearly have for one another, d- d- you know, just whatever the era is, right? Tell me about your experience that night. Man, it was great. And it started, one of the first people that I got a chance to see was was Joey. And he gave my wife th- this big hug. And sh- and then after, she was like, that's Joey Harrington? And I was like, yeah. And she said, he's so nice and he's amazing and all I'll, of these I'll, things. I'll pause now. I'll pause my game. But it was great to see Demetrius Williams. I hadn't seen him oh, in forever. One of, I, my, one of my favorites. One of my favorites. Yeah. I I talked to Ed Dixon regularly and so many Another of them. I mean, Ruben Drones. It was so great to see them. And it just brought back so many memories. But the thing that I appreciated the most about the entire game is how far Oregon has come in terms of not just – not just the performance, which is the on the field game, but they have turned the game day atmosphere into entertainment. Like they put on a show prior with the Oregon Duck, the greatest showman and everything in between. Like they literally put on a show. Told they you guys. Fireworks and, and people on stilts and everything. And then, so they put on a show. It was an entertainment. It's like going to a Bruno Mars concert or going to a Taylor Swift or Beyonce. You not only got the performance of them singing your favorite songs and winning and everything else, you got a chance to be entertained. And I was entertained from the beginning. I talked to Ohio State fans. They were like, this was the greatest game day environment that they've ever been in. And that's honestly, I think that that's where Oregon's branding has done a good job. They they market the duck, the the brand and everything else. And yes, winning matters, but it's the environment that has created such a, you know, an attractive spectacle. All right. Now, after the game, you tweeted, Oregon is the best team in college football. Back that up. Okay. Easy. Because Joey, Anthony... Aaron, who has the best win in college football right See, now? See, that's the corniest thing. No, 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 it's no, so no. Corny. I'm asking. That doesn't... Who has the best win? And hold up. I got, got more for you. Um, who has the most between Texas and Oregon? Who has the current most top 25 wins? Oregon two, Texas one. Over top 20 teams, Oregon two, Texas zero. Over top five teams, Oregon one, Texas zero. Strength of schedule, which all y'all like to throw out there and all the SEC people y'all. love to have. 
Oregon 35, Texas 82. How about strength of record? Oregon number one in the country, Texas number six. Aaron, there's nothing to talk about. They should be ranked number one right now. Okay. Hold on. First of all. Hold on. Wait, wait. Go ahead, Joey. Joey, go ahead. Who cares? Thank you. That's Very one. True. That's one. <laughs> so but, here, but here's the thing. <laughs> Just because Team A faces a tougher schedule than Team B doesn't mean Team A is better than Team B. You can't control your schedule. That logic is nonsense. Now, you can say Oregon has faced the tougher schedule based on the rankings, which are all going to change anyway, all you want. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily better than all those other teams who didn't, who are still undefeated, by the way, like Penn State, like Texas, because they didn't play Ohio State, which for all we know, by the end of the season, Ohio State could be 9-3, and three, and it might not matter. But anyway. What, 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 we're I'm, talking about right now. But right, right, right now, they now. play a tougher schedule. That doesn't make them necessarily the best team in the country. That's ridiculous. It, okay. George, George, you, you, figured out, you figured out a way to how to shut up Aaron. Drop, yeah, oh yeah, because I shut facts. up, right? Because I shut okay, up. Okay, that's what you do. Just keep dropping facts because that's how he wants to live. <laughs> he always wants to give you these, these facts. So nice job with that. That, that was that was Okay, excellent. so Newman, do you agree? Do you agree that yes. Oregon's the best team in the country? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, okay. there's a still a lot of football left to play. Hey, let's go do it. But I got one of the best football teams to go do it with. Hey, I'll jump on their train for sure. Okay, so last year when Oregon lost by three at Washington, no one in the state of Oregon wanted to admit that Washington might be the best team in the country or better than Oregon. And everyone went to the, well, who would that's be favored at a neutral? Aaron. Who would that's be favored at a neutral? It's the exact same thing. What do you mean that's a lie? You were saying the same thing. Yeah, no, you no, 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 and no, other no. Aaron, let me finish. Aaron, let me finish. Aaron, Aaron, I put you were out pointing out who would be favored. Joe. You were pointing out who would be favored Joe at a neutral poll. site. At a neutral site. You kept harping that. I put the Unafraid Show poll out every single week for the last two years without fail. And I've had Washington, and last year I had Washington ranked in front of Oregon damn near every single week. There, there, was, there was nothing to talk about. They had proven it on, on the field. The only sketchy time that I had is when they should have lost to Arizona State. That was it. So, so now you want to walk it back. Aaron, it's, 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 it's okay. I know. I'm not walking and anything be, back. And, and, and Aaron wants to be so good I'm on walking his chest right back. now. That it is, uh, that it he I'm has not worried about that best in turn. What it okay, what, right. what the question is, but Joey, no. Joey, Joey, you didn't get a chance to answer. Joey, who he is said the he best didn't care. in college? Joey football said he right didn't now? care. He didn't get care. a chance to answer. He said he didn't care. I don't care. Doesn't matter. He doesn't care. Unimportant. Joey, Joey, Joey I don't, care. I don't, I don't care. George, I mean, and not, I'm, you know. It, you okay. got asked a question, we're, you we're, answered the question. We're running awesome. along in this segment. We come from the Jimmy Radcliffe George. school of thought, which is hey, yes. you just do the work. I don't care if you're number one in week six. You know, I, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you're number one in week 11. I don't care if you're, you're number one coming into the college football playoff. Yeah. All that matters is at the end of the season, who's left standing. Right now, I haven't seen enough Texas to be able to compare them to say Texas is better than Oregon, Oregon is better than Texas. I can't make a, um, an apples exactly. to apples comparison. And frankly, you know, I don't like, sometimes I want to eat oranges in the fall. After all that, you know, you go through Honeycrisp, you go through Pink Ladies, you go through the Fuji's. Like sometimes like, you don't want to deal with apples right now. I just want an orange. So you know what? Joey I'm going to go back to my check. My king is in check. You guys figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're gonna, no, we're gonna we're gonna go to break because we got a whole another segment with our guy George Reister, and we'll get into how big of a win this was for Lanning, and then we'll talk about the road ahead. Because hey, upsets happen in college football. That's one of the beauties of the sport. We'll be back with more on Talking Ducks. All right, we're back on Talking Ducks, and George is still here. So George, I want to ask you real quickly. Okay? George one, is Hawaii. How big of a win was? Oh, that's right. George is joining us from Hawaii. He mentioned so. Thanks, George, Aloha for taking time out for the Hawaii, beach to come Sunday. argue with me. Hey, hey, it is go Ducks every single day. <laughs> so, obviously, you think this win makes them the best team in college football, which is fine. Was this a program altering victory, and how big of a win was this for Lanning? Oh, I think that this was a major victory. I don't think it's a program altering victory. I think that. It, it may alter people's view from the outside of, oh, wait, hold on. Not only did they beat Ohio State in 2021 at the shoe, now they did it at home too. So now that one win doesn't look like an outlier. And one of the things that you've noticed when you get into the polls and everything else, it is 
Alabama lost to Vanderbilt and then damn near lost to South Carolina and they didn't even drop in the, in the polls. And I do think that, that once you win games like this, there's a certain level of respect that the logo gets in terms of no, 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 that I know that they struggled there, but that's still a great football team. And I think that the respect is the thing that is the most, that was gained the most is the national from the writers, the committee voters and everything else. So when it is a year, whether it's this year, next year, five years from now, when you're that team that's on the cusp of making the playoffs, now your logo is going to do some of the, the work for you. All right. That's a fair answer. Okay. So let me ask you this then about landing though. How, did, we talked about this earlier. We all kind of agreed that it was a big win for landing, but he didn't yeah, have yeah. to have it. What's your feelings on it? Cause you know, there's some big games that they've lost, but he's a young coach, and he probably might have, might have got a big victory last year in Liberty in the Fiesta Bowl, but they had to play Liberty, right? So, yep. how big of a win was this for for Dan Lanning? Oh, it's it's uh, huge because it, the recruits that were there this weekend, you got five stars, big four stars, and everything else, and and we've talked about how recruiting on a micro versus a macro level that if you have more five stars on your team, your team's going to be better. Even if some of them don't pan, pan out that, that your team overall. And then in the micro, a two star can turn out to be your best player on your, on your roster. But this was huge for Dan Lanny and his credibility going, going into homes. And one thing that coaches always have to do, they have to keep hope alive that they have to be able to, to sell no matter whether you went undefeated or whether you went defeated like Washington did that year and went 0 and 12, that you can go into people's homes and that up, huh? sell them that the future is brighter than the past. So if, so it, even if you, like like what Washington ended up in the playoff last year, right? And they ended up in the national championship game. It was hard to sell recruits because their coach left and everything that the future is brighter than the past. And after last season and after a win like this, Dan Lanning can go talk to parents, talk to recruits, talk to other coaches because some of his coaches are going to get hired into other programs after this year and sell those new coaches that the future is brighter than the past. Wow. Okay. So real quick, uh, I'm going to come with Joey and, and uh, Newman first. We, we don't have a lot of time in this segment. But in the past, Oregon has had big wins. Michigan in 03, then they lost 405. Oklahoma in 15, they ended 7-6. W- number seven, Washington in 2018, then they lost 304. You know, Ohio State, they beat Ohio State a few weeks later, they lost to 2-2. Two and two. Stanford, can they avoid stumbling like that? And is there anyone on the schedule that scares either of you? We'll start, let's start with Joey and Newman real quick, then we'll come back to George. Well, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, you, you still got to play the games, and you got to respect your opponent. I don't care who it is. Uh, but I will say this, you know, this team is different. This team, Oregon always had a lot of dudes on their football team. They had a guy, you know, here and there. There's a, there's a ton of dudes on this football team who can play the game, and they play it well, and they believe in their coaching staff. They built that trust both ways. This team is different. This, 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 this team is special. OK, they're not the ordinary team walking down the hallway. OK, this, this team can play. And when you have a lot of dudes, Dan Landing said it, when you have a lot of dudes on your football team, it makes it a lot easier to coach. And, and mo- most successful coaches have great football players playing for them. This team has quite a few. So you're not worried? They're not going to stumble? No. OK, Ooh. Joey? Um Am I worried? Where where would be the stumbling block? And I said it from the start of the season that Wisconsin game is is the one that, yeah. that worries me a little bit. Right, you're gonna get up. You're gonna get up for a an Illinois team that is an upstart. Right, and your coach isn't gonna let them. You know, let that one slide under. You're gonna get up to go to the big house. You know, even if Michigan isn't the team that they were last year. Th- that game in Camp Randall in November against a Wisconsin team that, you know, quarterback goes down and they lose a big one early in the season. Like, that, that's a team that people could sleep on. I, you know, it, it may not end up being that way, but um, if I'm circling a game as one that yeah, makes me go like that, that, that's the one. Real quick, George, you? I look at it. I look at this weekend as the, as the hardest game so far. Because of course the Ohio State game competent and everything else, but you're but you're on a short no short no week. you're on a short week. 
Purdue just took Illinois to the max last last week. So you're on a short week. You're a, you're on a high. And when I said the job's not finished, I sent that yeah. that Kobe video to, to to Dan this morning, and he said, "Hey, man, brother." Because it is important that you not get caught up in, you know, because it it's easier to handle defeat than it is success. Because success, sometimes you you feel like you made it, we've arrived, we know what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. And you cannot have a letdown. And as the season goes on, that pressure is going to go up and up and up. And Joey, and Joey knows, like when we lost to Stanford, at home, the in uh, what was it, 2000, 2001 should have been in the national championship game, yeah, 2001. D- despite losing that game, that Stanford game, we were we were playing well, all that stuff, and we lost focus for a little, little bit, had some punts blocked, and we, we just didn't play our best game. And the pressure will mount as the season goes on. But if if Coach Lanning, if he's doing his job to the maximum level, he will be. A, a nuisance in practice on on those weeks like the Wisconsin week and this week people the players will be like why is coach tripping because he understands the gravity of what's at stake that's I gotta say All that right, I, I was gonna say like I would not want to be a fly on the wall at the practice facility this week because <clears throat> for that reason like I remember pl- I, I looked at I looked at someone after Alabama lost to Vandy and I and I said you know you know why they lost is because Saban was gone and Saban would have made that the most the week from hell for those players mm-hmm. after they beat Georgia and I'm sure that's exactly what Dan and Tosh and all of them are going to do it's going to be the week from hell at practice field. All right, we have to go to break, George. Thanks for joining us once again. Uh, Go back to your hula lesson. We expect to see video later. (laughs) And uh, we'll come back with our final segment segment and give you our predictions for Mighty Purdue that now we're going to need to be afraid of. I guess George and I talking too much ate up a lot of our time. So real quick, guys, let's break down this Purdue game. Is it a trap game? We'll start with you, Newman. Well, you know, anytime you win a big football game or you win football games, Sometimes it, it, it hides mistakes, uh, and then you're gonna you know you're going to the next game that the team is not as high as Ohio State. Uh, it's all about you. It's not about Purdue. It, it's about what you need to do, what you need to learn from from the pre, from the game that you won. That was a big game because you made some mistakes. <clears throat> excuse me in that game. So you have to find a way to correct those mistakes and get better. You know and, and improve every week. And we're with Purdue again. It's a faceless opponent. I don't care if they're if they are really bad. They don't have a whole lot of dudes. It doesn't matter. It's not about them. It's it's about you and what you do on the field. So it has to be a great practice week to take care of business. Joey, what? <laughs> Your assessment of Purdue. You asked Anthony Is a it? question. Ask me the same thing. <laughs> what? See, why are you being difficult when we're already running out of time? <laughs> Give me your assessment of Purdue. Are they a threat? You said, is it a trap game? Ask me that question. Is it a trap game? Yes. Let's go to break. Oh, my God. So... See, I mean, seriously. Now, George, week... George tells you that his wife thinks you're amazing and it goes to your head and now you want to be a diva. I Short see week, okay. First, massive okay. emotions, inc- like incredible letdown. Absolutely. Like it has all the, all the, a team that took Illinois to overtime. This is all the makings of a trap game. Absolutely. Purdue has lost 66-7, 28-10, and 52-6. Um, exactly. They give up 450 yards a game and 39 points per game. There's nothing trappish about this game. Of course, crazy things happen, right? Vandy beat Alabama, but I'm not buying it. But we'll be back with our official predictions after this break. All right, we're back for our final segment on Talking Ducks, giving our predictions for the Purdue game this week. I got the Ducks rolling. I don't think that this is remotely close to a trap game. I would be worried if Purdue had a defense at all. They don't. So I'm going 44 to 17 Ducks. Joey, let's start with you. And I'll ask you the question. Give us your prediction for the game, Joey. It is a trap game. And I will give you my prediction for the score. 56-7 Ducks. (laughs) Trap game doesn't mean they're going to lose. It just means it's a trap game, right? Bingo. Newman. Hey, I got the same score. I, I have 42 to 3. It, it's, it's, it's a runaway. You know, Purdue, they, have, they played a great game against Illinois. Uh, yeah, 
but uh, no, no. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of Talking Ducks. Maybe Jordan Kent will return next week if Joey's ransom check passes. Muster with the bank? We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. But thanks for listening and joining us and watching the show. And hey, great night in Austin last week. We'll see if they can make it stand up the rest of the season.